Bentley here. Good evening to you. On behalf of the Calgary Climate Hub, I welcome you to A Climate of Change, our weekly live cast exploring with thought leaders from across Canada what this wildly unprecedented moment in history means for our province, this country, the economic system, and specifically the climate crisis. In spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Tsiksika, Kainai, Pikani, the Tsutina, the Yaxi Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nations of Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. I'd like to also make a second land acknowledgement on behalf of another group of folks that have a stake in this land that we stand on today, and that is our children, our niece and nephews and grandchildren, and all future generations. I urge you to keep them in mind when you're making purchasing, purchasing decisions, decisions in business and your personal lives, and of course in the voting booth. And in this time, as we face unprecedented change and start making decisions about what comes next. Um, before we begin, I wanna thank our sponsor, Skyfire Energy has been designing and installing solar PV systems for homeowners, business owners, utilities, municipalities, and First Nations since 2001. They're an employee-owned, certified B Corporation with offices in Calgary, Edmonton, Penticton, and Regina. Their staff is one of the most experienced and qualified teams in the industry, having completed many of the largest and most complex solar projects in Western Canada. Their vision is to bring the, ma the magic of solar power to the world for a stronger, healthier, and more sustainable global community. Thanks so much, Skyfire. Um, we start with a brief presentation from our guest, Dr. Joe Vipon, followed by a lightning round of three questions. We'll be asking all of our uh, climate of change guests over the coming weeks, a Q&A session with some Climate Hub alumni and allies, and we'll close with what we're calling the live feed, yes or no's, where we take questions from you via our Facebook live post or Zoom chat. Just be sure your question can be answered with a yes or no, and we'll get through as many as we can. Tonight's guest, Dr. Joe Vipont. Joe is a co-chair of the Calgary Climate Hub and an emergency room physician working on the front lines of the coronavirus pandemic. He penned a number of op-eds on climate and the coal phase-out, and his latest piece, articulating the need for all of us to mask up when we leave our homes during this time, was picked up by McLean's Magazine. We'll post the link in the comments. We're speaking to Joe tonight about his experience in running successful campaigns and climate campaigns and achieving bona fide results, a critical topic for those of us seeking to ensure the world we return to once the coronavirus has come and gone is one that is resilient, future facing and climate friendly. Joe, welcome to A Climate of Change. Thank you. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Give me some thumbs up. Yeah, everything's working, great. Um, so great to be here. I'm, I'm pretty excited that we're launching this series. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about all the people that are coming through, but basically it's gonna be a who's who of, of uh, amazing climate brains from Calgary and around Canada. And I'm, I'm quite humbled to be the, the, the guinea pig to start this. Um, I, uh, I, I recognize that um, as a guinea pig, there may be some technical issues going forward. So. Um, we will uh, put, your, put your technical issues in the chat so that we know what's going on and hopefully this will all work. So when I was asked to do this, initially I was gonna try and do some kind of piffy little, what's the analogies between climate and COVID and I was gonna you know, try and write the things everybody else is writing, basically steal everybody else's ideas and put it together for you guys. And um, I decided to, to switch things. I decided that I, I, what I really wanted to do was talk about advocacy because um, I've been really fortunate and I'm gonna try and bring up my PowerPoint presentation here. Uh, yeah, I have to share my screen. Sorry y'all. <clears throat> We had this going seconds ago. I think I just have to click on that. There. Can you guys see that? Looks good. Okay, Steve, you might want to mute yourself. Okay. Um, just, just as an FYI. So, um, yeah, advocacy. So I've been involved um, now for eight years, which, um, which amazes me that this has been my life for eight years, trying to, trying to create change. And so I've been involved in a number of campaigns and they haven't all been successful, 
So, uh, but, but I have had some pretty fun ones. And so I want to share some of those campaigns and then share what I've learned so that we can move on um, together as a team and try and make more change based on some of these thoughts. The first campaign I was ever involved with was um, the, the Alberta coal phase out campaign. I was, I was kindly invited to, to, to weigh in on this um, report that was released by the Pemin Institute in my organization and the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. And basically uh, it looked at what the health impacts of coal-fired power was. And it was what launched the Alberta coal phase out campaign. Um, and so I initially was just kind of a passive person, but I, I pretty quickly got involved in strategy and, and uh, kind of being a, um, a spokesperson for the movement. Uh, and that was what really launched the work that I've done. And of course, we won uh, November 22nd, 2015. Um, at, there was a coal phase out announced. So we know coal fired power burned in Alberta after 2030. And, uh, and, just to put this in perspective, that's 44 megatons of emissions comes from coal, well, at least in 2015, was coming from coal um, at the time. And uh, that's about 6% of Canada's emissions. So pretty incredible to be a part of that. Uh, we took a month off and then launched a new campaign, the Canadian Coal phase out campaign. I was the lead on that. That lasted for one year, uh, almost uh, 11 months and almost exactly to the day um, the Canadian coal phase out uh, was completed um, where they dropped the year by 2020, but to 2029, December 31st, 2029. So we gained a year in, here in Alberta. And that was another 22 megatons. So that's 66 megatons of, of emissions that I've had an impact on. Um, and that's about 9% of Canada's emissions. So, um, so that's pretty fun. So now we're going to move on to some of the other stuff that I've been involved with. After I got involved in that, we the Canadian Association of Residents for the Environment was looking for a target. Um, and I remember specifically talking to, uh, at a wine and cheese, we're trying to figure out what to do. And this one um, uh, doctor said to me, you know what we really need is we need a, a recycling program um, at this one hospital's surgical. Like it'd be so good if we just had this, this OR suite you know, doing some, some recycling. And um, we're thinking about this. It's like, no, no, no. What we need is all of Alberta to have a, a powerful recycling program and some energy efficiency and all the rest of it. So we said, let's create an office of sustainability. And we lobbied and we lobbied and we lobbied. And that was, I think a nine month campaign approximately. And guess what? Alberta Health Services now has an office of sustainability. It's totally accidental that my face is in this shot. It was the only page I could find with this on it. Um, but the uh, office of sustainability, this is a, you know, this is a $14.7 billion organization and one of the top five employees in all of Canada. And they didn't have an office of sustainability until a bunch of doctors stepped up and said, we need this. The final campaign I wanna talk about is the mass campaign. And, and this, this is one of the reasons why I thought it'd be fun to talk about advocacy, because this is a campaign that's going on right now. <clears throat> it wasn't um, too long ago, about mid-March, that I started to recognize that masks were an essential component of managing the coronavirus um, um, pandemic that's going on and that nobody was talking about this like it was actually um, discouraged to be wearing a mask if you weren't <clears throat> actively sick so myself and a couple colleagues wrote this op-ed on april 5th saying we really need to start talking about masks and three days later so that was a very short campaign or two days later um Theresa tam issued new guidance on the wearing of masks um, so uh, that was uh, actually the, the op-ed the op came out on Friday. This was on Monday. And we, um, so, so pretty actively involved in this campaign too. Um, and really what ties all these things together and, and what makes advocacy special is advocacy is an effort to change the status quo. So if the world is going in one direction, as an advocate, what you're trying to do is curve that uh, change that curve, trying to push things in another direction. And you know what? Status quo does not want to change. It's basically the world humans are always resistant to trying to change the status quo. And that's why advocacy is so hard. When I was doing the coal phase out, um, I was involved, uh, or I, was, I was doing some stories with my kids. 
And uh, this quote came up and I said, that quote is just way too perfect. When the impossible comes merely difficult, that's when you know you've won. And I, I've had that thought so many times because I've had so many people say, you can't do that, that'll be impossible. Um, and then <laughs> there's that moment where somebody goes, yeah, that, it's gonna be really hard for you to do that. And then you're like, yes. So let's talk about the seven things, eight things. I've added an eighth today. If you've seen this talk before, you'll get an extra bonus thing to do. The eight things that make, um, that make a campaign work, at least in my mind. The first is select the right target. And this would arguably be the most important um, lesson. Make many partners, meet with anyone and everyone, perfect your messaging, listen to your critics, creatively use the media, own the social media, and start again at number one when you're done. So let's kind of break these out. We'll talk about each one and, and why they're important. So select the right target. Um, if you pick the wrong target, you're gonna lose. Unless you pick the right target, uh, it's very unlikely that you're going to have a successful campaign. And what do I mean by the right target? This is my very fancy hand-drawn graph um, that I've uh, put together for, um, for another presentation I was doing. I don't know if I have, yeah, I can do a little arrow here. So if you look down here at the bottom, we've got difficulty of achieving hard and easy. And then on the, on the y-axis, we've got magnitude of impact, minimal and maximal. So you're looking for this sweet spot up here. You can think of an easy and minimally difficult, uh, a minimally impactful uh, task. That would be something like, let's, um, let's put a recycling bin on the end of my street and then collect the bottles every, at the end of the week. You know, I could do that. It'd be very easy. It would take me you know, two minutes to put together. And you know, once a week, I have to go pick up the bottles. But really, the impact is, is, is not very good. Um, you can think of it as something extremely hard with minimal impact. Let's, um, let's try and get everyone uh, to wear hats so that uh, they don't get uh, uh, sun, sunstroke. I mean, that would be very hard. You have to do behavior change. And you know, maybe it would have an impact, but maybe not. The other thing that you can see it think of as a m very difficult but maximally um, uh, impactful thing. That would be something like, um, well, let's, let's shut down the oil sands tomorrow. Okay, maybe in the time of COVID, that's maybe not as uh, difficult to believe, but, but uh, you know, let's, let's stop all planes from flying tomorrow. You know, that would have a huge impact, um, but really, is it, is it ever gonna be achieved? So yeah, let's, let's not even think about that. So what we're aiming for is that something that's relatively easy to do that has a major impact, something like a coal phase out. And so that's why the coal phase out um, was our first target. It, it may not be the largest GHG emitter in Alberta, um, but it was pretty big. And with coal, uh, you know, compared to the oil sands, there is minimal employment involved with it, minimal um, government royalties. And there's a really reasonable alternative to that, which is wind and solar, geothermal, and energy efficiency. So you can imagine that this is something that would be achieved. Um, and, and indeed it was. Um, next thing is make many partners. We, um, when I launch any campaign, I try and get as many um, partners in on that campaign as possible because I don't want whoever I'm trying to uh, advocate to to think I'm a lone wolf. I want the, them to, to see that this is a broad coalition. So when it came to the, the coal phase out, our main partners, whereas the Asthma Society of Canada, the Lung Association of Alberta and North Shore Territories, the Pemmin Institute and our organization, Cape. But we actually went around and we petitioned basically anybody and everybody to sign a document saying an open letter saying that they were supportive of, uh, of a coal phase out. So when we actually um, were close to the end, we had this list of 44 partners and this is the letter that, that we put together for this. This was a full page ad in the, uh, in the Globe and Mail that we ran a couple weeks before the, the, the coal phase out was announced. And we had 44 partners, companies, um, a lot of health organizations. We really highlighted the health organizations, those eight logos that you can see up there. Um, and, uh, and, and this was really powerful because people could see that there was a broad coalition of, of uh, organizations that were interested in this. 
Um, and yes, if you're wondering, that is my, my mom and my daughter in the picture on the full page ad. That's one of the advantages of running the campaign is you can think, sneak in something like that into your, uh, into your advertising. All right, next uh, is meet with anybody and everybody. You never know who's gonna be your ally, which means that you really gotta reach out to many people and, and sit down and talk to them. In the time of COVID, it's hard to do a face-to-face -face talk, but that's really what this requires, this meeting face-to-face, -face, getting to know people, and not only getting to share your um, thoughts with them, but a lot of these meetings are about making relationships. And another really key learning that I came from this is that often it's not a single meeting that's gonna make the difference. Um, you really have to do serial meetings. These relationships build with time and people's ideas change with time. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, when we first started on the coal work, uh, we, we met with a guy called Dr. Charles Talbot. Dr. Talbot is basic, was basically the Dr. Hinshaw of back then. He was the chief medical officer of health. And him and his scientific advisor were kind enough to fly down to Calgary uh, to meet with us for a, a one hour meeting. Now, that was quite an honor to have him fly down, but when you actually care a lot about climate change, you're like, oh God, you flew down from Edmonton to meet with us for an hour, this is horrible. And it was actually a pretty horrible meeting. We sat down and he had some pet project, something about food security that he wanted to talk to us about. He was not even that interested in talking about coal. It was kind of brushed aside and we left that meeting going, well, that didn't go anywhere. About six months later, we met with him again. And this time he was the one who called the meeting. And his question was, I've been thinking a lot about the coal phase out. I'd like to know more, can you tell me more? And so we spent a really productive meeting talking about um, coal. And then we finally had a last meeting. The last meeting was in the legislature and it was with the Minister of Environment, the PC Minister for Environment and the Minister for Energy. And in that meeting, the Minister for Energy was poo-pooing the idea of a coal phase out. He was kind of slagging us. And in that meeting, Dr. Talbot stood up, literally stood up and said, listen, you guys have to listen to these people. They know what they're talking about. This is really important. And so I was flabbergasted because I really felt this guy was putting his job in line. These were his bosses, his political bosses, and he was willing to step out and, and, and step forward for us and put his job in the line. And it was because of that relationship we built, and he never would have done that on day one. It was really that series of meetings that allowed for that evolution. Messaging. Messaging is really important, and this kind of ties right in with the meeting, um, and and I think with some of the other stuff, some of the some of the um, media stuff that we're going to talk about. Every audience requires a different message. The public care a lot about safety. There's something called "What's in it for me." Um, everybody who's watching a TV news clip or reading something online what they're really thinking about in the back of their minds is what's in it for me. We're, we're innately quite a selfish uh, species. And so, you know, it, it really has to be what's going to change um, for them. And so for the coal phase out, the really important message was health. Like this is going to have a real impact on your and your children's health. If you have asthma, this is going to make a difference. Um, if you have COPD, this is going to make a difference. There's mortality issues. Um, so this will, could keep you from dying. That's a powerful message for the public. When it comes to politicians, they care about two things. They care about getting elected. <laughs> so votes are really important and they care about money because they're the holders of the purse string. So whenever we went into um, a meeting with a politician, a lot of the time it was, um, you can sell this to your public and this isn't gonna cost a lot of money. In fact, it's gonna save you money. And those are important messages. Listen to your critics. I can't stress this enough. If somebody has something that they're pushing back against what you're saying, 
you better pay attention because they're probably not the only ones thinking this and you better have an answer to them. If they're right, you better rethink your campaign. But if there's something that they're bringing up that you're not sure uh, about, you better find out what the right rebuttal to that is. And that's, uh, I think, really key. Um, so one of the things that, that happened is I was at a, a presentation at the University of Calgary and, and somebody said, well, can you show that people's um, health has gotten better in Ontario because they phased out their coal-fired power? And I'm like, yeah, that, that's right. There, there should be some kind of a footprint there. And so the first thing I did was I looked at their, their um, smog-free days, their smog alert days. Sorry, it's the opposite to smog-free days, their smog alert days. And in 2005, they had 57 smog alert days. Um, when you think about it, that's one seventh of the year. So that's a day where you're not supposed to go outside and play uh, but, or, or even mow the lawn um, because the, the air is so bad. And in 2013, they had two. And in 2014, they had zero. So I knew that over that period of time that the emissions in Alberta had gone up because we'd actually built a whole bunch of new coal plants. Keep Hills 3 was built in uh, 2011, I think, and um, it was one of their plant builds in, in, in 2005. So I said, well, why don't we compare the air quality in downtown Edmonton and the air quality in downtown Toronto over time? And you could actually see that over that period of time, Ontario's air had gotten substantially better and Alberta's area air had gotten substantially worse. And there was this, you know, crossover point where, um, where Edmonton's air was much worse than Toronto's. And that was a major headline. When you think of Toronto being the, the big smoke um, and, you know, 4 million people and piddly old Edmonton with its 1 million people, um, you know, clean prairie airs, mountain airs uh, being worse than that. That was a really impactful moment. And it all came because we listened to our critics and tried to figure out if their criticism had any validity. With the masks, somebody's actually put together, this is a Jeremy Howard, he's the mask for all guy in the States. He's put together an answer to every single one of the questions that we've heard um, when people say you shouldn't be doing masking. What, what about if people touch their faces more? Aren't they gonna like infect themselves because they touch the mask? Well, that's a good question. Is there any evidence for that? Well, no. In fact, the evidence is that you can't stick your finger up your nose if you're wearing a mask. So it, it, it's probably protective. So um, this, this kind of thing is amazing. Own the media. So really, when it comes to changing people's thoughts, the media is our, our biggest tool. Um, it's the only way to get into people's homes is to, to, to be a part of this system. So there's a bunch of things you can do. Easiest thing is to write an op-ed. Anybody can write an op-ed. All you have to do is have an idea, you know, be semi-coherent. Um, don't lie too much. You can lie a little bit because it's an opinion piece. Don't lie too much. I've never lied in an op-ed for the record, but um, I've seen that. Um, and, and yeah, you submit it. So um, when we started off our op-eds, we just, you know, it was, it was very uh, mom and pop, goody two-shoes stuff, like coal is bad for you, we should stop burning coal. Then we had to get a little bit more um, creative because one of the things, the three most important letter in news is new. Um, you're not gonna be able to sell something that is old, that has been said before. So you have to create new stories. So one of the things we did is we brought in, we created a, we created a, a panel discussion. So we brought in all the, this is back in 2015, I believe. You can see our, our uh, ex-premier at the time, just a, just a plain old MLA, Rachel Notley, um, representing the NDP, Joe Cece representing the Wild Rose, um, Donna Kennedy Glanz with the PCs, and, um, and uh, uh, David Swan with the Liberals um, talking about coal. And interestingly enough, this cost us $300. We rented a room, we rented a sound guy, it lasted an hour, we put some posters up and we attracted 80 people. And so you think, well, how can that change the world? Well, the thing is about 30 of those people were news people. 
And so we had news stories, we had radio stories, we had newspaper articles, and this is the kind of article that came out. In fact, the, I was amazed, the Sun actually had the most powerful article out there as far as print goes. Alberta Tories locked up, put a political will to phase out coal. That was the headline. It was amazing. Um, and we had it recorded. Anybody could download and listen to the whole thing, kind of like what we're doing today. You know, we're doubling our money by, by recording it and being able to share it. Um, so really, really powerful tool, a panel discussion. I want to do more of those. Then we all uh, wrote some other op-eds, but we had to do, you know, be creative about those because you can't just keep saying the same thing again. We found out that coal was actually artificially subsidized. It was the cheapest in North America here in Alberta. And uh, we were giving our utilities a free pass. And so um, uh, that, I remember the day I was at a, an event at the University of Calgary and one of the professors said, did you know that the coal royalties in Alberta are the, are the, the cheapest in, in all of North America? And I said, yeah, I did know that because <laughs> I put that in your brain. It was such a great feeling to think that, uh, that I had created an idea and inserted it into somebody's brain. Um, the other thing you can do is do advertising. So this is a bunch of doctors who put some money together to create these uh, uh, billboard ads. And we also have Facebook ads. Um, we asked the doctors to just donate some money. We did this during the election campaign. But what's really interesting is almost every time we've run an ad like this, we've gotten stories like this. You can double your power. In fact, I think we got more of an impact from the news related to the billboard than we did from the billboard itself. The billboard was just a means to an end. Own the social media. Social media is powerful. And we know this, um, but uh, it's your, um, you have to be very adept at this. And so that you have to find people who are good at this. So one of the things you can do is you can have a web page. Web page is really good for historical stuff. This is where we had, you know, a bibliography of research. You want to know about the science behind this? You can go to that. You want to know what media we've done in the past? You can go click on that. You don't want to know events coming up? You want to give us money? These are, this is the place to do your, all of this kind of, uh, of tasks. But you also need Facebook pages. So this is um, uh, our Alberta Cool Faso page back in the day. This is 500. It's now up to, I think, 2,500 or something like that. It still exists. Um, yes, that is my mom uh, as the number one liker there. Um, and this is where you try and get people engaged. Daily posts, what's new, what's, what's in the news, why should people be continuing to engage on this topic. And Twitter, of course. This is a Twitter um, series that I've been running for the masks. I've been comparing um, the countries of the Czech Republic and Austria who have put in mandatory masking to Poland, which is not. And you can see that over time, especially on this graph over here, uh, Poland uh, is diverging from the two places with masks. And so every single day I put up a new post and I'm getting people excited about the fact that we can see in real time the public health impacts of these things. Down here, you can see where Canada is compared to all these countries that have mandatory masks. And then finally, start over. Ron Southern, the, uh, the owner of ACO, when he passed away uh, on the news media, somebody said his quote, oh, a quote, which I loved, which is, when, we, when you win or lose something, you have one day to either celebrate or grieve, and then you have to go back, back at it. So, um, so I think once one of your campaigns is accomplished, you take what you've learned and then you start again. And so with the Can Alberta coal phase out, we won, we took a break, we launched the Canadian coal phase out. With the masks, we had finally convinced our public health officers to go from do not wear masks to you can consider masks. And now we're trying to push, let's make sure everybody wears a mask. Let's do mandatory masking. Um, and uh, so this is an op-ed that ran on, on Monday and I'm continuing to work on that. So going back over the seven lessons, select the right target, make many partners, meet with anyone and everyone, perfect your messaging, listen to your critics, creatively use the media, own the social media, and start again at number one. So 
I am going to talk briefly about the three campaigns that the Calgary Climate Hub is hoping to launch over the next few months. Um, some of these are already active and maybe you want to get involved. So the first is the four, the four uh, major builds that the city of Calgary wants to do. We think that every single one of these builds should be a net zero building. In the past, they've had to have some lead certification for their buildings. They've actually dropped that. Um, but there are still some sustainability requirements for future builds, but we think those need to be very um, like based in a net zero world. So you're, if you're going to build something like this, let's build it right. Let's build it for the next 100 years and let's make sure we're not in a big energy sucks. The green stimulus program, as we move out of the the pandemic as we move beyond the, the coronavirus, there's gonna be a lot of money that's flowing in to keep companies going. And we think that that money should be flowing specifically not towards oil and gas, but towards sustainability programs. Um, both of these two programs um, are being run by uh, Joan uh, Lawrence, who's one of our uh, board members. And so if you're interested in being a part of either of these two campaigns, reach out to her. This is my baby. I like electricity. I think electricity is really important and I think we need to electrify everything and make sure it's the cleanest electri electricity possible. Calgary is special in that it has its own utility, NMAX. It's owned by the city. And that means that we as citizens um, should have the right to decide how it's managed. And I think that NMAX needs to make a pledge just like Synovus, just like um, Trans Canada Pipelines, just like, uh, you know, a lot of companies out there, just like um, uh, tech, tech industries, needs to make a pledge to be net zero by 2050. And you might say that 2050 is a long ways away, so why does it matter? Well, all of the things that NMAX is going to build is going to have a lifespan longer than, than 35 years, which means that they, if they put this in place, they cannot build an unmitigated natural gas plant ever going forward, and they need to really take this into a, a account starting the day after they put this in place. So this isn't about 2050, really. This is about, um, you know, J uh, June 20, 2020. We were going to launch this back in February. Unfortunately, because of the, the COVID uh, crisis, um, we've decided to hold off on this because I really think this needs to be something that, uh, that has a conversation at all levels of Calgary. And so we're going to wait till the, the media lens clears a little bit so that we can really focus on this. I want to remind people why I do this and why you probably want to do this as well. Um, it's really about these guys, the things that we love. We, we act because we care and we care about the things that are closest to us. Just because this existential COVID crisis is here doesn't mean the existential crisis of, of the climate is going to go away. And so this is, all, continues to be the time where we need to focus our energies on, on, on changing the curve, on changing the status quo towards what we want. Um, you may be sitting in your basement watching Netflix. Maybe it's time to think about doing some other things. If, at least if you're going to watch Netflix, watch those great movies that are going to inspire you. Um, I just found out today that Aaron Brockovich is on uh, Netflix. So is uh, The Post. It's a great movie I watched last night. Um, uh, you know, gain inspiration from, from, from those kind of sources. There, there are lots of like-minded people out there. And one of the things that advocacy has given me is all these friendships with these amazing people that, are, that, that, that share the same values and that, uh, that are, are intelligent and caring. And these are the people you want to surround yourself with. Um, there is so much work to do. And we need every single person involved in this. One person can't change the world. You cannot change the world, but you and the rest of us can. And if we work together as a team, that exactly is how we're going to win the climate crisis. You need to find something you're passionate about because unless you care about it, you're probably not gonna put the energy that's needed that's gonna make the change that we need to do. The first step is saying yes. If somebody offers you an opportunity to get involved, say yes. So with that word, our Calgary Climate Hub AGM is this Monday, April 27th. Um, if you're a member already, we want you to be there and vote. 
Um, if you're not a member, there's an opportunity to find out what we're all about. Uh, and you can learn about the various things that you can do to get more involved at the hub. We also have a very special guest speaker, the very Reverend Bill Phipps, an amazing speaker who really talks a lot about the spiritual aspects of the climate crisis. Um, and, and you'll find him engaging, amazingly engaging. And I can't wait to have that happen. Um, and these are my deets. If you want to get involved, that's my Twitter handle. That's my email address. The Calgary Climate Hub is, uh, that's how you've become a member and the Facebook page that I, uh, that I help to run. Um, this has been really fun. It's really hard to have no engagement with the audience. I don't really even know if you're all out there, but I'm hoping that this has been uh, uh, of use to you. And um, now that it's been recorded, if you ever want to go back and, and, and listen to some of those lessons, um, you have that opportunity. Or you can send me an email. Thanks, Joe. Um,